I'll be. Um, it's really exciting to actually be in a room with lots of people today. Um, Bianca gave me the, the option of presenting online from London, and I thought, you know what, actually, to be in a room, see an audience, actually interact with people, I was super excited by that idea. So um, thank you so much for having me up here this evening. Um, uh, and lovely to see you all. I'm Dr. Meg Spriggs, as Ben says. Um, I am a, a postdoc in the Centre for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College London. So I work with, yeah, with Robin Pahat Harris, David Nutt, and David Ritzo. Um, and today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to provide kind of a, a bit of a bit of a broad talk today. Um, what I really want to do is is work through some of the stuff that we're doing at the centre at the moment at Imperial College. Um, uh, I'll start by just going through some background just to sort of get everybody on the same page of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about psychedelics, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about psychedelic assisted therapy, and some ideas that we've got at the moment about how it works. Um, I'll then uh, provide an overview of our recent study looking at psilocybin versus escitalopram for depression, which many of you might have heard of. Um, and some insight into our current study looking at psilocybin um, in the treatment of anorexia nervosa, which is the study that I'm leading at the moment. Um, and then at the end, I just want to go through um, something that I'm quite passionate about in moving the psychedelic field forward, and that's incorporating the patient voice into psychedelic studies. Um, so, um, I know that many of you are, are familiar with psychedelic psychedelic assisted therapy, but just to kind of create that solid foundation moving forward, what are psychedelics? Um, the psychedelic that I'm going to focus on mainly in tonight's talk is psilocybin, which is the active component in magic mushrooms. Um, and that's part of a class of what we refer to as classic psychedelics. Um, that also includes DMT, and, uh, which is the active component in ayahuasca and LSD. Um, what all of these uh, drugs have in common is that they are structurally similar to the endogenous neurotransmitter serotonin. Um, so we know that all of these compounds work through activation of the serotonin type 2 A receptor of the brain. Um, so this plot here, this figure here, is the distribution of serotonin type 2 A receptors throughout the brain. Um, the areas that are red are those that have higher density of, of the expression of these receptors. And as you can see, um, they're kind of mainly expressed in, in higher order areas of the body. So things like your temporal lobe and your frontal lobe, um, areas involved in higher cognition. Um, the graph next to it um, is from a study where they looked at um, the relationship between uh, serotonin uh, receptor occupancy in the brain and the intensity of the subjective effects. And what they found was that the greater the occupancy of those receptors um, uh, when psilocybin was given, um, the, the bigger the subjective effect. So we know that the, the activation of this receptor is really important in the um, subjective effects of psychedelics. Um, and just to put this into a broader context, I'm talking about a very specific class of, um, of drugs, of, of psychedelics, the, the classic psychedelics, which are here. Um, this is kind of a broad spectrum of, of um, psychoactive drugs. Um, but oftentimes when we talk about psychedelic therapy, we talk about some others, um, such as MDMA and ketamine, which are equally important you know, in their own right. Um, and have huge potential in therapy, um, but they work through different neuronal mechanisms. So MDMA is a presynaptic releasing agent of serotonin, whereas um, ketamine is an NMDA um, antagonist. Um, so while, again, while these compounds are important, in tonight's talk I'm really focusing on psilocybin, um, which is a classic psychedelic and associated with serotonin type 2 Uh, in terms of what psychedelics do, I'm sure that everyone has heard of the kind of uh, subjective effects associated with psychedelics, particularly those on a sort of more perceptual level, so things like simple and complex imagery, um, changes in the, in the meaning of perceptions, um, audiovisual synesthesia, um, but you also get these kind of more intensive, higher order experiences, such as 
insights and um, spiritual experiences, blissful states. Um, some of those words up there might look a little bit more intimidating, things like disembodiment and anxiety. Um, but these are all things that we can work with in a therapeutic setting. And in fact, uh, psychedelics are incredibly safe, um, particularly these classic psychedelics. Um, so this plot is taken from some work um, from David Nutt and an independent scientific committee on drugs that he brought together in 2010 um, to rank 20 of the most commonly used drugs for their harms um, and risks. So um, the red represents harm to others, uh, so, yes, harm to others, and blue represents harm to the user. And I don't know if you can read it, but this here is alcohol, um, and that was ranked as the most risky of all of the drugs. And then you've got things like heroin, crack cocaine, methamphetamine, cocaine, tobacco, all the way down to here, but we've got mushrooms. So psychedelics and uh, mushrooms and LSD in particular are incredibly safe. Um, they've got very low toxicity and no addiction for a while. In fact, you're much more likely to overdose on something like caffeine or you know, many of the drugs that we take on a regular basis. So um, they, they are really, really safe to work with physiologically. Um, what's important though is doing it in the right context. And that's where so the psychedelic assisted therapy um, so many of you have probably heard of this, this um, of psychedelic therapy. You might know a bit about it already. Um, but there's been growing interest in this area in the last, say, 20 years. This figure here is just taken from Google Trends, and this is um, searches for the term psychedelic therapy. And you can see that since 2010, there's been a steady increase in people's interest in psychedelic assisted therapy. Um, and this largely comes off the back of a growing number of small-scale clinical trials demonstrating safety and feasibility and possible efficacy of using psychedelics in the treatment of a range of um, mental health issues such as um, OCD, end-of-life distress, addiction, depression, suicidality, and also just having general increases in people's well-being. Um, so a review that was published last year um, it looked at 10 clinical trials that were published between 2000 and 2020 um, and found that overall this research supports the feasibility, safety and possible efficacy of psychedelic assisted therapy. So what is psychedelic assisted therapy? Um, I think what's important to emphasize at this point is that when we talk about psychedelic assisted therapy, that assisted therapy bit is really important. We're not just talking about giving someone a drug and sending them on their very way. Um, and this is very different from a lot of the other models in psychiatry at the moment, which is about you know, taking drugs on a regular basis to manage symptoms. Um, psychedelic assisted therapy is a therapy model. So it's using psychedelics within a wider therapeutic approach. Um, and that therapeutic approach is being kind of developed across various centers across the world that are using um, these kind of treatment models or exploring them. Um, but what I'll do now is just kind of talk through what a participant in one of our studies would experience in terms of sort of psychedelic assisted therapy and what our model looks like. And it is very similar across different sites. Um, but um, I like to think of it as kind of this three-pronged approach. Um, so when a participant comes into one of our trials, they'll go through an intensive screening process, um, and then they'll get paired with two sitters or guides or therapists. Um, so one of them will always be a, a clinician of some kind, like a therapist or a psychiatrist, and the other one might be a researcher who has the experience in the field. Um, but the, the participant will work with those two um, uh, guides for their entire time throughout the trial. Um, and the first phase of the, the therapeutic approach is preparation. Um, so the participant will spend time in this phase um, getting to know their guides, working with them, building a trusting relationship. And also the guides will spend time providing the participant with some of the tools to navigate the psychedelic experience. Um, because a lot of the people that come through our trials haven't had a psychedelic experience before, 
So that preparation phase is really about um, providing some, some information on, on how to kind of get the most out of it um, when the dosing sessions come. Um, so the next phase is the dosing session. Um, depending on the trial, uh, we'll usually have between one and three dosing sessions. Uh, and this is a full day in our clinical center. So we do work in a, in a hospital setting, but our rooms are um, designed to be nice and comfortable. Um, we use nice comfortable blankets and put nice paintings on the wall and make it feel nice and homely. Um, and so when participants come in in the morning, we prepare them, we give them the medicine, um, and we give them an eye mask and headphones. Um, and that's to encourage that they go on an inward journey. So they'll spend the day in the um, psychedelic therapy room with their guides. Um, their guides will be with them for the entire day. But it's we do encourage that they go on an inward journey. And we have a specially designed playlist. Mendel Kalin did a lot of work at the beginning of our trials developing our playlists that um, we still um, sort of use various versions of today. Um, uh, and that, that music's a really important part of the therapeutic process. Um, after that comes integration. So, uh, as I say, the dosing day is an entire day. The acute effects usually last for about four to six hours, um, so it is a full day. Um, and then integration starts the next day. Um, and in my sort of opinion, this is kind of where the hard work begins to some extent. Um, because the dosing sessions can, you know, the, the psychedelic experience can, can open the mind up to these new experiences, but it's during the integration phase that it's about taking that information and using it and incorporating it and integrating it into your life. So, um, the, you know, this is where some of the more talking therapy begins, um, and it can take days, weeks, months, or even years to integrate a psychedelic experience. Um, so, you know, people, there, there is an idea that, that um, psychedelic therapy is kind of like this magic bullet, you know, we talk about it like this transdiagnostic thing that can, um, uh, you know, and people have this idea that you can come into the session, have this experience and step out a fixed human. Um, that's usually not how it works. Um, I would rather frame it as psychedelics open a door, but it's up to the individual to walk through that door and take that information forward into their life. Um, so, you know, thinking along the lines of um, psychedelic, thera uh, psychedelic therapy, um, you know, we talk about psychedelic assisted therapy or psilocybin assisted therapy, um, and uh, different uh, researchers and, and groups have been pairing psychedelic, um, you know, psilocybin sessions with different therapy models. Um, uh, to kind of adapt it to different uh, populations or, or try it with different approaches. So um, it's been paired with things like CBT and ACT, which are quite well-known therapy models. Um, the ACE model, the Accept, Connect, Embodiment model, um, was developed by Ros Watts off the back of the um, depression study at Imperial College. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, you can find papers on that online. Um, it's been paired with existential psychology and emotion-focused family therapy. Um, and while there are all these various different approaches, um, what remains consistent across all of these is the importance of the therapeutic alliance and trust. Um, so when I sort of talked about the preparation phase, it's really important to build that trust and build that therapeutic alliance. Um, because we know that, that having that allows someone to really get the most out of the sector. So that's a little overview of what psychedelic assisted therapy is. Um, uh, how does it work? Um, you know, we're starting to, to develop an understanding of how it works. Um, you know, very early days of this research, but there's lots of really great neuroimaging research going on now to better understand the brain mechanisms underlying psychedelic therapy. Um, but one of the sort of uh, the big theories um, put forward by Robin Carhart Harris and Carl Friston on, on how psychedelic therapy might work is built on this idea of, of the, the Bayesian brain. Um, so this this concept of the Bayesian brain, uh, it, it's it's kind of built on this idea that, that within our brains we have a generative model of the environment. 
of all the, uh, all the time. And that generative model is, is our prior expectations of the world around us. Um, so it's a really efficient way for our brain to focus normally, uh, function normally. Um, because we, there are things we know about our world, there are things we know about our environment. And when our brain incorporates that into our generative model, it doesn't have to be like coding that information all of the time. So it means that we know that the sky is blue, or, I mean, well, in this country it's usually grey, but um, we know we've got these understandings of the world. We know that if you turn on a tap, that the water will flow downwards. And what that means is that when we experience this in our world, we've got that idea in our brain, we don't have to code that information every time we have that experience. What we do code is when something differs from our prior expectations. But we have these prior beliefs about our world, these prior expectations, and they're kind of held in higher level um, uh, areas of our brain. But they also trickle down and impact how we perceive the world around us at every level of processing of the brain, in the brain. And what that means is that when we have incoming information, it's shaped by our prior expectations. So as our sort of sensory information comes in, it's shaped at each level of the processing hierarchy as it goes up. Um, as I say, really efficient. But it can lead to difficulties if we develop unhealthy or um, detrimental prior expectations about the world. So if you have a, a core underlying belief about yourself, that you're unworthy, um, then you don't get a promotion at work. Then you're immediately going to interpret that lack of promotion as evidence for the fact that you're unworthy. Um, so you can see how in um, uh, mental health conditions that are characterized by this rigidity of thinking of these core beliefs that you know that you can see how that kind of shapes our experience of the world. And we talk about how you know, you, people see through the lens of, of, of depression or um, something really shapes or colors their experience of the world. Um, and this is one theory of how that might happen. Um, now what the Rebus model proposes, which is uh, what I say is proposed by Carl Friston and, and Robin Kaha Harris, is that psychedelics work at the level of these priors. They work at the level of these prior expectations of our world. And what they do is in the acute state, they relax those priors, um, relax our prior beliefs, and open up this window of opportunity for change. Um, so following that acute experience, um, the brain is more malleable and more ready to kind of change and, and implement, um, sort of, or, or start to potentially experience the world in a different way. And that's that where that therapy model, uh, or where the therapy is, is um, most important. Um, so uh, there's lots of, as I already mentioned, there's lots of good neuroimaging research going on around kind of understanding this. Um, but another thing that we really wanted to explore was what's the sort of, what's happening on a psychological level um, that might demonstrate this, this relaxation in the acute phase, this relaxation when under the acute um, experience of the of the drug, and then that period afterwards when you're malleable to change, um, malleable to revision of your beliefs. And so myself and some colleagues are um, developing a questionnaire to do that. Um, so it's called the Relaxed Beliefs Questionnaire. Um, and um, what this involves is asking participants to identify um, some beliefs about themselves and about their world. Um, so in this case, the, for the data that I'm just about to present, we ask participants to identify a self-positive belief, or a positive belief that they had about themselves, uh, a negative belief that they had about themselves, a positive belief that they had about someone else, and a negative belief that they had about someone else. So the positive other belief um, was usually someone that they loved, um, you know, their, a partner or a family member, um, the other negative belief uh, or negative belief about someone else was usually someone from their past that they had an argument with or someone, you know, a colleague at work or something like that. Um, so in this particular study, um, we asked participants to identify these beliefs and we, they then had two psilocybin sessions, one with a very low dose of psilocybin and one with a very high dose of psilocybin. 
Um, and we measured their confidence in these beliefs before the psychedelic session, during the psychedelic session, and a month after. Um, so at each point, we asked them, how confident are you, or how certain are you that this belief is true from zero to one? Um, and these were self-identified beliefs for them. So we didn't give them the beliefs. We asked them to identify beliefs that they, they held. Um, so first looking at the data from the low-dose psychedelic experience. Um, so as you can see, so this is pre, pre, acute, and post. Um, across those three sessions, people's confidence ratings and their, and their beliefs that they identified remained pretty stable. Um, so there wasn't really a lot of change from pre to acute to one month post. However, we got a different pattern of belief change when uh, we gave people a high dose of psilocybin. Um, so we had um, pre, acute and post again, but in the acute session we see a drop in people's confidence in their beliefs. Um, for three of the four belief categories. So the only one that didn't drop was the positive belief about someone else. Then one month later, we see the belief confidence change again, but the pattern of change depended on the belief category. Um, so for both self-positive and uh, other negative, the beliefs went back to kind of baseline month later. So they returned back to where they were before. But the self-negative belief continued to decrease. So people's confidence in their negative belief about themselves continued to decrease a month after their high dose psilocybin session. So what this suggests to us, or what this shows, is that acute relaxation of confidence belief in this, uh, on the, sort of, or during the, the um, psychedelic session, and then a post-acute revision of beliefs. Um, what I find really nice about these data too is that, again, you know, the only belief that doesn't really change is the positive belief about someone you love, um, which speaks nicely to kind of this idea of psychedelics increasing at love, connection, all those kinds of things. Um, but the other really interesting um, thing about these findings is that um, the change in people's belief confidence and their negative self-belief correlated really nicely with the mystical experience or oceanic boundlessness during the psychedelic session, um, and also changes in well-being in the long run. Um, so this kind of is the first sort of psychological data to demonstrate that, yeah, that acute um, uh, uh, relaxation and post-acute revision of beliefs. Um, and as I say, really interesting that the different belief categories show different trends over time. And I think what's really important to emphasize at this point as well is, is context. Um, because we talk about psychedelics as, as non-specific amplifiers and and this I and you know that they 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 create this the state where someone can change, where someone can adapt their beliefs. Um, however, they make you know they make you very sensitive. To what's going on around you, and so the context will potentially be a huge, have a huge impact on what you know, how those beliefs change over time. So having a positive context during the psychedelic session and afterwards is really, really important to facilitating that change. Um, I'd say you know, any drug is only as safe as, uh, as the context you take it in, but I think that's particularly so for psychedelics. So with that in mind, um, you know, that's a little bit of an overview of where we're at and kind of understanding psychedelic therapy. Um, I wanted to provide a brief overview of um, our recently completed trial um, looking at psilocybin compared to acetylopram um, in the treatment of depression. Um, so this was a, a large-scale trial that was published earlier this year, led by Robin Harris, Bruno Garibaldi, and Ros Watts. Um, and this was the first head-to-head -head, um, comparison of psilocybin and escitalopram, which is a leading or the, the, the leading SSRI um, used for depression. Um, yeah, the first the first study to, to directly compare these two approaches to the treatment of depression. Um, 
So the aims of the study were to use fMRI to compare the therapeutic mechanisms of cytotype therapy with um, an SSRI, um, to compare the side effects, and to compare the efficacy. Um, it was hypothesized that there would be different um, brain responses as measured using fMRI. Um, that cytocybin would increase well-being to a greater extent than acetylopram, um, and that there would be no difference between the two groups in the primary outcome, which was the quits, um, which is a, a measure of depression, a, a very widely used uh, self-rated measure of depression. So there were 59 adults with moderate to severe depression recruited for this study, um, and there were two arms. So it was a phase two double-blind randomized control trial. Um, one arm was the psilocybin arm, and in that arm, individuals were, or participants um, were given two doses of psilocybin three weeks apart within this psychedelic therapy model. And alongside that, they were given a course of placebo capsules that they took every day. Um, in the other arm, the other arm was the exotelegram arm, and in this arm, um, participants also had to uh, cytosine dosing sessions, but with a very, very low dose of cytosine, <coughs> basically placebo. Um, and they were, alongside that, given a six-week course of exotelegram. So first, looking at the safety outcomes, comparing the two groups. Um, so the little triangles are cytosine, and the little circles are exotelegram. Um, and over here, we've got the 95% confidence intervals of the difference between the two conditions. Um, basically, what this shows is that um, both groups had some side effects of their treatment, whether they were in the acetalopram arm or whether they were in the psilocybin arm. There wasn't a whole lot of difference. Um, there were some small differences like greater anxiety and dry mouth in the acetalopram arm. But importantly, there were no serious adverse events across the trial in either. So both the psilocybin condition and the acetalopram condition were um, so this is the uh, sort of key outcome measures. Up the top there is the quids. Um, so that's the depression scale. Um, the uh, x-axis is time, and you've got um, the first dosing day at the beginning and the second dosing day about halfway through. Um, and what this shows is that there wasn't overall a difference um, uh, between baseline and follow-up in uh, quid scores and depression ratings because both groups decreased in the depression ratings across the six-week course of the trial. But in the psilocybin arm, the decrease was a little bit quicker, um, so faster onset of the antidepressant effect. And also the remission rates were higher um, in the, uh, the psilocybin arm than the acetylopram arm. So all, uh, almost 60% of participants in the um, psilocybin arm were classed as remitters at the end of the trial, whereas only 30% of those in the acetalopram arm were classed as remitters based on this depression outcome measure. Um, when we look at well-being, however, there's quite a stark difference. Um, I hope you can all see that. Um, uh, I don't normally have to duck underneath my chart and my slides. Um, uh, yeah, so as you can see here, the psilocybin arm um, showed a much greater increase in well-being across the course of the trial as compared to the acetylopram arm. Um, and when we look at the other secondary outcomes, what we or this is actually all of the outcomes. So you got quids at the top there, which was the primary outcome, um, and then um, a bunch of others below. Um, and the quids is the only one that didn't show a significant difference between the two conditions. All other outcome measures favoured um, uh, psilocybin. Um, so we've got other depression measures there, like the HAMD, the MADRAS, and the BDI, which are all commonly used depression measures. They all showed, they all favoured the acetylopram condition. Um, we've got um, multiple measures of well-being, so the WEMWEBS and flourishing scale. We've got um, anxiety measures, um, work and social functioning, anhedonia, avoidance, suicidality. All of these measures favoured psilocybin over So what we can conclude from this study is that psilocybin had a faster onset of the antidepressant effect. Um, psilocybin was consistently superior across all the secondary outcomes. 
Um, they have slight differences in the side effects, but no serious adverse events in either condition. Um, and these results do signal a bit of hope for um, alternative treatments for depression. Um, so I haven't presented any of the neuroimaging findings because they are still yet to come, so watch the space for those. It's very exciting. Um, but what this has also done is um, provide sort of a, a groundwork for studying future or further indications, other indications. So um, until recently, a lot of the work of, of the Centre of Psychedelic Research has focused on depression. So we had um, a small scale pilot study and in this larger randomised control trial, both focusing on depression. Um, but now we're starting to reach out and look at other um, indications as well. Um, and what I want to do now is talk a little bit about psilocybin for anorexia nervosa, which is the study that I'm currently leading um, and is ongoing at the centre. So I won't have any results today, but I want to present you with some of the groundwork for why we think psilocybin-assisted therapy might be beneficial in this particular patient group and why it's important to, to, to assess it. Um, so just a bit of background, anorexia nervosa um, is defined in the DSM as uh, a restriction of energy intake leading to significantly low body weight, an intense fear of gaining weight, and disturbances in the way one experiences their own body shape and weight, with undue influence placed on um, uh, weight and shape and self-evaluation. Um, so Anorexia has a much lower prevalence than some other mental health conditions, lifetime prevalence of 0.48%. However, it's unique in that it's the only one of the only um, psychiatric conditions that doesn't have approved um, pharmacological or therapy treatments. Um, fewer than approximately, uh, fewer than 50% of those diagnosed with anorexia reach a point of, of remission, reach and maintain remission over, um, over their lifetime. Um, it has the highest mortality rate of any psychiatric condition. And that's due not only to the physical complications associated with the disorder, but also with having um, incredibly high suicide rates. Um, so there's a real need to find new treatments for anorexia. Um, and you know, there are a lot of treatments at the moment out there being being trialled, but a lot of them are targeted towards symptom management. Um, so dealing with these things that define it under the DSM criteria. However, I would say that that is just really the tip of the iceberg of what's going on for people with anorexia. And managing symptoms is one thing, but what we could potentially be looking at is getting below the surface of those, um, those uh, symptoms and looking at what's underlying the eating disorder. And that might be where psychedelic therapy comes in. So to date, what information do we have that psychedelic therapy might be appropriate and effective in people with anorexia? Um, not a whole lot, but there is some. So there are a few case studies out there, or well, there's this one, this case study here that I'm about to present, a little bit of qualitative data and a little bit of quantitative data. However, there haven't been any clinical trials published just yet. Um, so there is actually a case report that we, um, earlier this year, got translated. So it was originally published in French, um, uh, but there is an English version out um, online now, available online now. Um, uh, this is a case report of a woman um, who was treated in the 1950s um, in a hospital in Paris. Um, by the group of led by Professor Jean Delay. Um, so in March 1959, um, this patient um, presented to, to the clinic. She was a 35-year-old female um, presenting with compulsive mannerisms concerning food. Um, and um, they uh, treated this woman with two intravenous, uh, with two injections of intravenous psilocybin. Um, now this wasn't in within the therapy model that we use today. It was in much more of a clinical setting. Um, however, the results were pretty outstanding. Um, and I just popped these two quotes um, from uh, the patient herself on uh, what she experienced and, and the outcome of that. So I really like that top one. Um, this was her, her impression of her psilocybin uh, uh, experience. So I'm flying on a ray of the sunlight. 
I am giddy. I no longer feel the weight of my liberated flesh. My body, my old constraints feel lifted. I don't have a body anymore. I am only a soul and I am real. Um, she then went on to say, I realized that in my cravings, I have to fulfill a nervous need. It was just me that was fed by my mom and that attachment, uh, and that attached me to her more. Um, so during her session, during her psychedelic experience, her psychedelic experience, she, um, you know, she experienced these these changes in embodiment, these changes of connection to herself, and also got to kind of understanding more the root of where her eating disorder came from. Um, it was concluded um, by the clinicians that um, in this case the recovery was immediate. The next day the patient was euphoric. The weight increased rapidly. At discharge one month later, she put on several kilos. In this patient, psilocybin had indisputable therapeutic action. Um, so as I say, this was before psychedelic therapy or the model that we use psychedelic uh, psilocybin in today. Um, in this case, she did actually um, show a relapse, show some relapse a year later. Um, however, um, you know, maybe if we put it within a psychedelic therapy model, it might be more effective in the long run. But this was the first demonstration that psilocybin might actually be effective for people with anorexia. Um, there have also been a couple of qualitative studies reported, um, and this was this research has been led by Adele and France and colleagues. Um, so they interviewed uh, individuals who had uh, reported a lifetime diagnosis of an eating disorder and had gone to ayahuasca ceremonies um, to help them manage their eating sort of symptoms and, and experiences. Um, these interviews were done after the ayahuasca ceremonies with these um, individuals. And what they found was that not only were there reductions and cessations in eating disorder pathology, but also improvements in the sense of self-worth and self-acceptance and self-love. Um, so these were themes that we also see in our depression trials. I've put up a few quotes here from this work um, that I really like. So ayahuasca helped me deeply connect with myself so that self-love had become a prevalent priority over self-criticism. That self-love became more important and more critical. <coughs> and that, to me, is the antidote to the eating disorder. Um, and I really like the quote at the bottom. I really just experienced my body as a gift. It was, I felt that it was malnourished. I could sense that. I could sense that I was not honoring the gift. Um, so this just provides a little bit more insight into, you know, the, the, these are the, the experiences of people who, who have, you know, used uh, ayahuasca and psychedelic to help them heal. Um, and, and it kind of indicates why we think psychedelic therapy might be so good for this group. Um, and then this is just some data that we published last year um, where we um, looked at um, survey data from individuals who reported a lifetime diagnosis eating disorder um, and had taken a psychedelic of their own accord. Um, so um, we've got depression ratings, good score and well-being here. And what this shows is that two weeks after a psychedelic experience, individuals with eating disorders showed a, um, a significant decrease in depression scores and a significant increase in well-being. Not only that, um, but the decreases in depression and increases in well-being um, correlated uh, or, or showed a trend towards a correlation um, with the intensity of emotional breakthroughs they experienced during their psychedelic experience. Um, so this um, indicates that, that that emotional breakthrough, that emotional experience is really important for facilitating um, positive change. So with that, um, at the moment, we are currently um, uh, uh, performing this study here. Um, Psilocybin is a treatment for anorexia nervosa, a pilot study. Um, so we started the study earlier this year. Um, I actually moved to, to London at the end of 2018 to begin planning the study, and we just started this year, um, partially due to COVID, partially due to the fact that these studies just tend to take quite a long time to get off the ground. Um, but um, the study has two aims. The first is to assess the feasibility and efficacy of treating anorexia nervosa with psilocybin assisted therapy. The second is to determine the neuronal mechanisms involved in psilocybin treatment uh, for anorexia. So um, the active period of the 
trial is six weeks. Um, in that period, um, uh, all of our participants, uh, we're recruiting 20 participants total, will receive three psilocybin dosing sessions um, within uh, the psychedelic therapy model. Um, they will also have two MRI scans and five EEGs, um, not during the acute sessions. Um, uh, and then there is a 12 month follow up period, with the most intensive follow up being the first six months after um, they, they finish the, the active trial period. Um, uh, so we're interested both in changes in, in uh, uh, any sort of psychopathology, but also motivation to recover and various other secondary outcome measures. Um, if you want to know more about the nitty gritty details of the study, we have published our protocol online. Um, in Frontiers, so it is available open access, um, so you can check it out there, um, but also happy to answer any questions later as well. As I say, the study is ongoing um, and will be continuing um, probably through 2022 um, with results being published in a few years' time. Okay, so um, yeah, so that's kind of an overview, I've given an overview of psychedelic system therapy. I've provided um, some background on, on the trial that we've just completed and the trial that we're currently doing at the centre. Um, the last thing I want to talk about tonight is something that I'm quite passionate about moving forward, and that's the patient voice. Um, so there's, you know, there's growing interest in psychedelic therapy, there's growing interest in where it might fit within our models of <coughs> healthcare. Um, and so we have this real opportunity to kind of build build a new framework for approaching mental health. Um, and I think it's really important as we build this to, to incorporate the voices of those who we're aiming to serve, um, those who are going to hopefully benefit from these treatments in the long run. Um, and one way to do that is using approaches like public patient involvement. Um, and this is where we work with members of the public. Um, uh, it's research performed with members of the public rather than to or about them. Um, it involves communication between researchers and people with lived experience or those affected by the research. And it creates this two-way street between us researchers and the communities. Um, so public patient involvement is something that, that you know, researchers are generally asked to do. Um, but there are sort of certain aspects of it that are more important when developing psychedelic studies. Um, and myself and a couple of colleagues, uh, James Close and Julia Borneman, um, we wanted to make this sort of easy for psychedelic researchers to do. Um, uh, so public patient involvement can be done, can be performed at any point when you're developing a trial, um, from the very early stages of the planning all the way through to when you disseminate the results. You can involve people with lived experience in the research process. Um, and what we wanted to do was create sort of a, a, some guidelines and a framework for psychedelic researchers to do this. Um, so we brought together a group of um, a, a, a few key groups of, of people um, to contribute to this. So we, we held a workshop with um, experienced PPI experts, um, former participants from psychedelic trials from our studies, um, both clinical and non-clinical trials and researchers working in the psychedelic space. And we, we spent an evening workshop kind of trying to identify um, what are important aspects of public patient involvement um, for psychedelic studies. And we got lots of themes, we got lots of ideas coming out from, from these different groups. Um, and um, through a lot of uh, you know, uh, analysis of this, um, we identified um, sort of four key areas that are important to keep in mind um, when doing PPI for um, uh, psychedelic studies. And that's inclusivity, purpose, learning, and trust. And from this, we've, we've developed a, a set of guidelines that, that, part of, that are all, well, they're not really guidelines, they're kind of ideas of, and a framework for um, psychedelic researchers to conduct PPI in their studies. So hopefully, moving forward, um, people can use this um, as a, a, a tool for involving the public when developing um, clinical trials. Um, but I just wanted to provide some examples of how we've done this in our research so far. Um, and hopefully this will kind of emphasize to you why we think this is really important. 
Um, so we did some um, public question involvement when we were developing our anorexia study. Um, so we held two online focus groups with 11 service users, so people with lived experience of, of anorexia, either people who are in recovery or people who have recovered. Um, and we presented them with our study protocol um, and asked them for feedback, asked them what they saw as important um, and what would be important for future participants in our study. We also asked them two additional questions. So what blocks have you faced in treatment and what does recovery mean to you? Um, and the first thing that we found um, when we did these workshops was um, it really helped us to understand what anorexia was for those suffering. Um, so the role that anorexia played in their life and their relationship with their eating disorder. Um, and, and what they wanted as well out of a, out of a treatment. Um, so I've just popped a few quotes up here to kind of uh, from this workshop to, to demonstrate what kind of what um, the focus groups attendees' experiences were of the eating disorder. Um, so um, so I sort of get quite scared of the idea of trying to like find those boundaries between me and the illness and wondering who I would be without it. What is life without it? That's my big big black hole that puts me off going further in any kind of recovery. And I don't just want to see like shades of gray or nuance. I kind of want to see beyond that. I want to be able to open myself up to color and brightness and more. Um, so we also were able to identify some key barriers that these individuals had faced when they'd um, tried different treatments before for their eating disorder. Um, so uh, some people said that they found the focus on weight recovery kind of put them off treatment. Um, and so they were really great, uh, they were really um, glad to hear that that was not a focus of our study. Um, also they identified the reluctance to give up control would be a key barrier for people looking at psychedelic therapy to treat um, uh, an eating disorder. Um, and we were able to identify some key kind of uh, approaches to overcoming this barrier, so things like building a trusting relationship and advanced planning of the practical details around study days. Um, and having good communication with participant support network. And all of these things were things that we were able to implement into our trial design. Um, we also um, found that uh, each of our attendees defined recovery in a different way. Um, and it wasn't all about um, you know, managing the diagnostic criteria. Um, and what that enabled us to do as well was develop a new study measure called the recovery interview. We were able to work with people under their own definitions of what recovery are and, and, and look at how that changes over the trial. Um, and I've just popped a couple more quotes up there um, related to what people saw as would be important um, or, or where they saw psychedelic therapy particularly being important for treating their eating disorder. Um, so I feel like psychedelic drugs might be really useful in helping people integrate those two sides of themselves into one. Recovery is being able to hold space for yourself. You can find that softness within yourself and really practice that self-love. And taking anxiety away from having those thoughts and just accepting it is something that I can see as being a good outcome of this kind of therapy. And another space where we've used um, uh, public patient involvement to um, uh, kind of explore the patient voices in chronic pain. Um, so this is another area that we're um, interested in exploring in our centre and developing a, a trial um, to uh, address this is um, yeah, psychedelic therapy for chronic pain. Um, so this work was led by Julia Borneman, um, where she conducted 11 semi-structured interviews um, with people who had used psychedelics in the treatment of their own chronic pain. Um, so while um, for the anorexia study we um, spoke to people who were um, service users, um, like people who had lived experience of anorexia but not of psychedelics, here Julia took a slightly different approach and she spoke to people who had used psychedelics to manage their own chronic pain. Um, so she had seven, uh, sorry, 11 semi-structured interviews and she asked people about the background of their chronic pain, um, their psychedelic use and how psychedelics might have been effective in managing the chronic pain. Um, and she um, uh, performed thematic analysis of these interviews and looked at the themes um, underlying um, the, particularly where they found 
um, psychedelics might have been effective. And she identified two core processes. Um, the first was positive reframing of their pain, and the second was somatic presence or mindfulness of body. Um, and a couple more quotes here um, that I just think are, are really beautiful demonstrations of both these um, areas. So in positive reframing, um, for me it was really about hope. Trying to trust that what my brain was telling me wasn't permanent. There are ways for my brain to decipher that in a different way. The psychedelics are the hope um, that things might be different, that they might be better. And I'm not going to read out this one of somatic prisons because um, it's quite long, but um, it really, what it demonstrates is, is how the, 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 the embodied experience during the psychedelic session and during this person's psychedelic experience was really important in facilitating. Um, positive change. Um, and so what this brought forward was these two aspects, positive reframing and <coughs> experience, which can now be incorporated into the design of the trial. Um, so things like bringing in um, aspects of embodiment into psychedelic therapy. Um, and and the idea that you know, working on these, the, the reframing of the pain um, might be an important aspect to focus on. Um, so again, just bringing us back to, you know, this is my final slide and sort of, I guess, my big final message um, is that, you know, we can use, we can incorporate um, communities, we can incorporate the public, we can incorporate the patient voice um, in moving forward and shaping psychedelic research together. Um, and with that, I'd like to finish by acknowledging all of the wonderful humans that are on this slide. Um, particularly thanks to David Arezzo, David Nutt, and Robin Kaha Harris, my mentors and the, um, uh, leaders of the centre. Um, uh, the clinical team working on um, the, uh, the anorexia trial, um, all of the members of the team, um, and thank you to all of you for attending tonight, um, and happy to answer any questions. why we use psilocybin as opposed to other classic psychedelics. Um, so I think there are a couple of sort of more historical reasons why we focus on psilocybin. I think LSD initially had a lot more kind of um, historical baggage associated with it. There was a lot more kind of fear and things around LSD. Um, David Nutt sometimes jokes that psilocybin was chosen because 
reporters can spell it, so <laughs> we're less likely to kind of pick it apart um, and be scared of it. Um, uh, so you know that's that's possibly why initially we started focusing on psilocybin, but also in terms of the therapy, um, psilocybin is has a shorter um, acute phase, um, so it's a kind of four to six hours, which is a bit more feasible in terms of therapy than, than LSD, which is you know you look at 12 hours. Um, so that's a you know 12 hours is a long time for the participant and the clinicians. Um, uh, and I mean there's lots of work going on now in, in looking at looking at DMT, um, which obviously is a much shorter DMT has a shorter um, active period. Um, so um, yeah, I mean that's possibly why. And that's not to say that that the other you know that that DMT and, and LSD won't have their you know their place too. Um, so I guess you know we've we've been focusing on psilocybin, but, but the door is opening now to other other classic psychedelics and other non-classic psychedelics. So ketamine, MDMA. Um, yeah. Um, in terms of the the compass trial and the differences, yeah. So they were they were differences in outcomes. Um, uh, there are slightly different patient groups. Um, so I believe that this was treatment resistant depression, whereas ours is, uh, this one was major depression, so they are different. Um, I'm not sure that I know enough about the nitty gritty of how they ran their trial to, to comment on why why there are these differences. Um, I guess we'll find out more as, as more information comes out about how they ran this. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's all important information to go into the pool of understanding, you know, uh, how to build a, a the therapy model moving forward. Um, so yeah, all of these studies are, uh, provide valuable information. <coughs> yeah. Can you talk a bit about the application efficacy of this um, larger dose um, system of the prevalence framework versus the earlier markers? Yeah. So the microdosing is a it's an interesting area at the moment. There's lots going on. Um, I guess you know the way that we frame psychedelic therapy at the moment is designed for those bigger doses. Um, if you know, I guess microdosing used for therapy purposes um, would be slightly different in terms of mechanism. Um, I think that you know the the larger doses have this these these acute effects, and I would say the acute effects, the the subjective acute are quite important for the therapeutic outcome as we frame it at the moment. Um, and you don't obviously get those with the, with the lower doses. However, the lower doses might um, you know, facilitate a, a plastic state for, for longer over a longer period. Um, I guess no one's really looked closely at, at microdosing and, and treatment. Um, uh, so there's, there's still a wide open door there in terms of research. Um, but there is lots of research going on in microdosing now. Um, yeah, I think I think the, the framework for therapy would be very different if it was a microdosing framework. Um, yeah, I'm not sure that really answers your question, other than saying that I don't know at the moment. And I guess that's a that's yeah, it's a, it's a growing interest um, area. Yeah. In the first part of the talk, you kind of talked about the two day trials. And I guess you give these kind of people some sort of um, intense psychedelic experience to see how it kind of epiphany, and then the next day, you know, feel like you kind of changed or whatever. But then I'm wondering if you have any data about how this kind of changes in the future. Uh, what happens to that? You know, in the recent the wild back into their own environment. Cool. So, um, yeah. So, first question: What happens in the long run? Um, and again, really important question. Um, 
and active area of research. Um, so um, the long-term data, like from the depression trial that I've presented today, aren't out yet because they're still being collected. Um, uh, but yes, you're right. So typically we have uh, only a limited number of integration sessions after after a psychedelic session built into our trial design. Um, uh, and you know, and, but but we're in full recognition that long-term integration is important. Um, and so part of the, the integration that we do provide um, is about building skills um, that can be taken out into into the as, into the wild, as you say. Um, uh, so what can we you know what can we help what what can we give people to help them to continue this process on their own? Um, another thing you know that we've incorporated quite heavily into the anorexia study is, is working with support networks and working with loved ones. So um, you know, all of the people that come through the anorexia study have to have a support person that they identify um, who we can work with to help them, you know, help continue that environment um, once we're no longer working directly with the person. Um, but that's a, it's a really important, you know, aspect of, of moving forward because, you know, if you look at the, the earlier depression studies, people do relapse. Um, and um, we don't really know um, how best to stop that in the long, you know, if this rolls out as a therapy model, we don't know if it's going to be down to, um, you know, long-term integration or more doses or something like that. Again, like an area that really needs further research. Um, and what was your second question? How does it compare to standard counselling? Uh, the therapy model itself or the outcomes? I guess, um, it's pressure, I guess, you Well, I guess the way that we're kind of looking at psychedelics is putting them within those models, within, so, you know, you could use psychedelic therapy within a CBT approach or within another approach, and it's kind of a tool to help facilitate the change that you might be <coughs> aiming for with these other models anyway. So, um, you know, people talk about psychedelic therapy being like 20 years of therapy in one session. Um, so kind of, you know, speeding up potentially that process um, or opening it up a bit. Um, there haven't been, as far as I'm aware, any studies that compare psychedelic therapy with just talk therapy in that way. Um, obviously there's the, the one that we had comparing it with an antidepressant. Um, but just with standard talk therapy, I'm not sure. But remembering as well that, that if all the participants that come through our studies have tried treatments before. Um, in the first, our first depression study, um, they all tried, I think it, it was a, they, they, uh, those participants were treatment, classes treatment resistant, um, and they tried, you know, most of them six or seven different types of, of therapy, be that talk therapy or um, antidepressants, and we found them ineffective. In saying that, you know, um, different approaches will work for different people. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure that that quite answers your question. No, I guess kind of on. Aren't doing that. Um, different groups are doing it in different ways and comparing it with different models, and, and I guess that's where it kind of, you know, that the base of the um, of the psychedelic therapy approach might be transdiagnostic, but then when you start looking at different conditions, you might want to start comparing it with different approaches. So CBT or um, you know, emotion focused family therapy is something that is uh, very kind of targeted towards eating disorders, and that's that's an approach that some groups are using. Um, 
So, um, yeah, I guess what I've presented is, is, is that, that base, the base of the um, uh, psychedelic therapy approach, but it is being paired with different things. Um, you know, in, in, in our depression study um, that came to develop the Accept, Connect, Embodiment model, which is, is bringing in um, aspects of um, acceptance and commitment therapy into the psychedelic therapy model. And so it, it kind of it is being done. Um, uh, and I guess time will tell um, how best to pair it with different approaches. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so how do you think the, the legal status for this approach is going to evolve, especially with this kind of uh, studies? So how is legal status, what, sorry? It is going to evolve in the approach psychedelics during these studies, the legal status. I mean, what's, what do you guess? Well, I hope that the legal status can change in a way that's going to make these studies easier to do <laughs> and um, make it more accessible for people in the future. Um, what that's going to look like, difficult to say at the moment, um, but I think there's change of foot. Um, definitely, I mean, you can see it overseas. Um, uh, so, you know, I think legalizing it uh, or decriminalizing it or at least making the therapy accessible is, you know, that's going to be huge. Rescheduling so that we can do the research a little bit easier without having to go through lots of, you know, hoops, paperwork. As I say, I joined the lab here in 2018 and we were just got started running this year and part of that is admin related stuff. Um, it, uh, it took them three years to get the first depression study off the ground because of the, the hoops they had to jump through. Mm -hmm. So making that process easier by rescheduling um, or something like that would, would be huge. Um, particularly at the pace that we're moving now in terms of um, you know, the interest that's growing um, and the, the social change that's happening, the research needs to keep up in a way. Um, so anything that, that can kind of help facilitate that in a safe way. Um, so alongside that, also giving people the resources to and the education and understanding, you know, having that education around what psychedelics are is, is really important as well. Um, so I think all of these things need to move in tandem to create a culture and environment around psychedelics that's going to be safe and effective. Yes? Uh, so, um, just in a similar sort of area of like looking for the future, but in therapy itself, it, assuming legal legal issues aren't really, like there's no legal roadblocks, because in the next few years, they'll say it's just best case scenario, um, psychedelics are made available for medical use across the board in the UK and countries. How how big of a change do you think? Uh, how big do you think like that it will be in twenty thirty years? Just to speculate. And I mean, how how will like say nice guidelines for treatment of all the different depressions we have right now? I mean, the different different conditions like depression and anorexia and everything. How will they change if if it's as big as this? And if we don't have the research now to, to know, when will we know how big it's going to be? Great question. So, what can psychedelic therapy do for psychiatry? Um, I mean, it has the potential to change a lot of how we approach psychiatry, whether that be the actual treatments that we use, but also how we frame it. You know, the fact that we've got this this approach that shows transdiagnostic effects is supportive of, of maybe moving away from the, the boxes of diagnosis and towards more transdiagnostic thinking. Um, there's lots of ways that, that psychedelic therapy can can change treatment. Um, the other thing that I think is really exciting about psychedelic therapy is, is that it also opens us up to thinking about all sorts of different approaches that might have one day been viewed as fringe. You know, if you can get people to, to accept psychedelic therapy, think about all the other things that we could start thinking about using more, like uh, even breath work, yoga, um, meditation. Um, all of these different approaches that people put on the sideline, um, they can all kind of come back up um, uh, alongside psychedelic therapy. Um, I think there's a lot of learning still to be done, um, and and that is happening. Um, you know, and and we're moving 
to uh, you know, opening up these doors. And, and but to do so, we need evidence. Um, and right, rightly or wrongly, people like evidence-based treatment. So we've got to give people the evidence. Um, and that involves the science. Um, and that involves the research. So really pushing the research will help us to move forward in the same effective way. Um, what it's going to look like, <coughs> who knows? Um, but I'm hopeful and excited to find out.
sure. I think you had a question. love to do these studies in nature. <laughs> um, that would be great. Um, at the moment, it's kind of, you know, we've got to keep within the realms of what, what's kind of deemed okay in, in uh, clinical trials, which is why we do them in it. And, and to begin with, I think that's really important that we keep them, you know, quite contained um, and, and in this, this, this more clinical environment. Um, but there is research definitely. Um, uh, there's a lot of um, work with with like retreats and things like that, where they're, they're you know it's it's all done in nature and, and in community settings. Um, some research from um, Hannes Kettner and um, colleagues at, at Imperial um, uh, is uh, came out earlier this year on on sort of the, the importance of community um, and and the role that that plays um, in group settings and. Um, we also have um, a few studies that uh, um, that have looked at nature connectedness, which which does increase even if we do it in this in this more clinical environment. Um, I think that that's definitely part of the future of psychedelic um, approaches is is um, potentially doing it in nature, um, uh, doing it in group settings, um, having a more community based model rather than this. Um, rather than the more clinical and medical setting. Um, and, and there's movement in that direction. Yeah, but um, the work of, of Hannes Kittner, if you haven't if you're not familiar with it, is, is something to check out because he's um, quite big in that um, space. I'm gonna stop the questions there if that's okay. Sorry, I know everybody's really interested. It's awesome. <laughs> um, before I stop I just wanted to add we do have a talk from Stephen Reed, who's the uh, Psychedelic Society of the UK founder. He gave a talk a few months ago on psychedelics and specifically nature related this. Um, it's on our YouTube channel here. Anyway, with that, um, thanks, Dr. Spriggs. That was really great. Um, I think everybody really enjoyed your talk. Thanks for coming.